Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Valentin Newhouse. I'm uh, one of the trauma attendings. I'm very happy to introduce Dima Eshmumimov. I met Dima Eshmumimov just recently in the ETH, and we talked about research. Uh, he has some fantastic research, Liver for Life, for example. And I'm more than happy that I'm uh, part of this lecture this morning about polytrauma. He asked me if I can assist him, and I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, Valentin, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Um, our hospital is a referral center for uh, patients with polytrauma, and we, uh, visceral surgeons, are involved in a multidisciplinary team and in treatment of abdominal trauma with colleagues from trauma department. Um, I would like to start uh, my presentation uh, with uh, some sentence with Harvey Mackey because time is one of the most important uh, factors in trauma setting. Time decides uh, the further course of the patients. And if you follow this slide, you see uh, three curve, uh, peaks of death in patients with polytrauma. The peak happens mostly during the first hours. As a medical doctor, we don't see those patients. They have uh, usually uh, trauma that is incompatible with the leave, for, for example, um, decapitation or massive extremity loss with massive bleeding, and usually we cannot help to those patients. And second group starts to die after within the two hours, and uh, those patients are of most interest for us. And then second peak comes after weeks due to immunosuppression uh, of patient and infection and complication of trauma. Uh, in my presentation, I will concentrate here because uh, we surgeons, abdominal surgeons, are involved in this part together with trauma patients. Uh, therefore, this is a deciding also for very uh, patients um, uh, for further course, and then it's called usually as a golden hours. And uh, as usually, there is a definition of uh, uh, everything and. Polytrauma usually is defined. Last treating injury of more than one body, region, and organ and system. And the injury severity score should be usually at least 16. And uh, this calculated that based on uh, body regions. You see uh, every region has uh, different uh, names. And uh, you can uh, define for every region, uh, give uh, points. For instance, minor, moderate, serious, severe critical and untreatable. And you summarize it with this formula and you can say if patient has a, a polytrauma or not. Also, I have to say uh, the definition is, uh, might be vary and there is a no consensus on definition, but this is a, one of the most common used definitions. And um, pathophysiology behind is uh, quite complicated. Uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, trauma patients, we have uh, hypoxia, shock, uh, uh, hypothermia, and at the same time, they have uh, multiple injuries of uh, bone structures, abdomen, and uh, trauma. All those uh, associated with uh, lack of uh, sufficient oxygen, oxygen delivery to the organ. And it happens usually within the first, three, first hours of uh, um, trauma. And uh, the main treatment uh, behind it is uh, uh, ITLS in damage control surgery. Afterwards, it comes uh, to uh, recovery slowly, and then between day five and 10, we have usually a window of opportunity. After day 10, uh, they start to have second peak, which I showed in the previous slide, because of uh, infection and immunosuppression. And uh, during the first hours of uh, trauma, the key factor is uh, to restore oxygen delivery to the organs. And uh, this is based on advanced trauma life support. Uh, and it's uh, all of, you know, this ABCDA. And all this is dedicated to deliver uh, sufficient oxygen to the system. For, is uh, for instance, brain can survive a few minutes without oxygen, heart as well. Muscles or kidney could tolerate some hours of uh, uh, oxygen deprivation. Therefore, it's quite important to restore it. Um, we start in a trauma setting uh, with the oral uh, um, examination. If there is any obstruction, it should be 
eliminated with intubation or with suction if there is any um, uh, aspiration inside. And the second thing is a uh, pneumothorax or massive hemothorax. In this case, uh, um, uh, you have to put uh, 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 lines to drain it. The most important thing, uh, if you have a patient with knife inside, usually it's not allowed uh, to remove this knife before arrival. Even in a short, uh, in a, a short department, usually you don't remove it because removal of any foreign bodies causes bleeding. Therefore, it, it saves also somehow um, tamponation. Therefore, uh, you remove it after uh, you have uh, clarified the, the location and uh, cause. And the third thing and, uh, is shock. Usually in trauma setting, we have uh, hemorrhagic shock. And it can bleed from extremities. It can bleed in chest, abdomen, pelvis, and uh, lone bone structures. The most important thing to eliminate is the, to stop the bleeding. This is a picture from Boston bombing. You see the patients uh, have uh, amputated extremities, and then they are bleeding. The first thing uh, is to stop the bleeding. Uh, quite challenging could be stopping the bleeding from pelvis because uh, the bleeding scars could be multifactorial. It can bleed from uh, bones, it can bleed from venous injuries, it can bleed from arterial injuries. And um, venous injuries and bone injuries, uh, uh, you, you may tampon it. However, before you tamponation, you have to fix pelvis. Otherwise, uh, putting all these causes could not help uh, if bone structures are destroyed and then because uh, they can just, uh, they cannot compress anymore and give pressure. Uh, therefore, first you have to fix it and then afterwards you, you go and then put uh, gauzes for tamponade. However, this can stop only venous bleeding or from bones, but it cannot help to stop arterial bleeding. Therefore, if there is arterial bleeding in patients with pelvis injury, uh, you can go for interventional, interventional uh, stopping or surgical ligation depending on localization. And angiography might help uh, to identify the cause of the bleeding. We are, as a visceral surgeons, uh, uh, involved in treatment of those patients, uh, especially in abdominal trauma setting. And we operate together with uh, uh, colleagues from trauma department uh, in a Abdominal trauma, we have to define priorities because uh, and uh, there is a two approaches depending on uh, uh, patient's uh, stability. If you have an unstable patient with hyperthermia, acidosis, and high lactate and coagulopathy, and the patient needs very high dosage of uh, vasopressors, usually you don't go for uh, definitive surgery. The aim will be in this setting damage control surgery. If the patient is stable, uh, no inotropic support and uh, uh, with urine normal output in the low lactate, you might try uh, to solve the problem in a definitive way. And um, the aim of the damage control surgery in a instable patients is to restore pathophysiology. It means first aim is to stop the bleeding and aim of the definitive surgery to restore the anatomy. If you go to the abdomen, the first priority is to stop the bleeding, and any spleen injury with bleeding, spleen should be removed. There is no role to save the spleen in a polytrauma setting usually. And for the liver, of course, there is a different levels of injuries. It can be just uh, um, with a knife, uh, or it can be just blunt trauma. In both cases, uh, the aim should be packing for the, um, to stop the bleeding. And uh, for vessels, you may try repair. Um, for instance, for aorta, it should be repaired, otherwise uh, it will not help. Uh, in infravenous uh, cava, if the injury is located uh, uh, in, in the infrarenal part, you may try repair or ligate, and suprarenal usually requires repair. And second priority in abdominal trauma is stop to contamination. 
In this setting, we usually don't put any primary anastomosis in damage control setting. The aim would be in this setting to just put the staples with a, a complete closure of intestine, or um, you can just uh, put a diverting stoma. And uh, in a second and later phases when the patient is stable, you may try then uh, restore the continuity of the intestine. And uh, for the limb, usually is removed if, uh, if you have unstable patients because there is a rule in a polytrauma patients, life before limbs. Uh, therefore, usually we cannot save the limbs and uh, of course it's uh, quite heavy for patients to survive afterwards. However, may we try to save uh, life and limb together. People have tried to do it. As I mentioned in my previous slides, patients are quite unstable during the first days. Therefore, you cannot put it at the same time. Therefore, people try to keep the extremity with ex vivo perfusion. This paper was published by Tiger et al. in Annals of Surgery in 2019, in June. Uh, they had two patients with extremities injuries in a polytrauma setting. They connected, as you can see here, uh, with a pump and used cristadiol in putting some electrolytes and perfused it for 16 hours, two extremities. And uh, afterwards, they connected to the patients. Interestingly, uh, if you see, there is an output which goes to the back to the machine, and they could not collect all these fluids from the resection surface. Therefore, they had to use almost 15 liters of fluids. And in one case, the uh, patient was uh, successfully implanted, uh, uh, only upper part. In the second patient, the uh, patient died uh, from a cardiac uh, 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 arrhythmia in postoperative setting. And uh, the second patient had also quite a high infection in this extremity. And uh, looking at um, all these results, I had a feeling uh, they don't have a specialty device to perfuse extremities. And uh, most probably, they didn't talk uh, to engineers because uh, extremities perfusion is, should be quite easy and uh, a system that can maintain extremities perfusion should be uh, not difficult to construct. And you see this is a one month after implantation. They had to remove lower extremities before implantation. It was severely damaged and patient uh, was using this uh, extremity after discharge in the uh, outpatient department was controlled. And uh, as you know, uh, our department uh, uh, has submitted uh, a novel perfusion technology for liver perfusion, uh, which can maintain uh, uh, viable human livers for one week. And uh, we came up with the idea and can be also used in the trauma setting. A novel concept would be, uh, if you have an stable patient, of course, you cannot put the extremity back because they don't tolerate it, and then here life is before limb, and you stabilize the patient with uh, uh, ITLS in damage control surgery, and uh, you put the extremity to the perfusion machine. You can preserve uh, one week. Let's say we never tried extremities, but the liver is quite a complicated organ, and the extremity should be much more easier. And uh, there is a window of opportunity, uh, which I showed in my uh, previous slide between day 5 and 10, and during this time period, um, you can try reimplant uh, uh, this extremity to the patient. And of course, um, there is no clinical data and there is no animal data. We don't know how it will uh, extremity then uh, will function. There is no data, but it's just an um, idea that can be implemented in a clinical setting. This is uh, my last slide, and I would like uh, with this slide to summarize. And time in the polytrauma setting is very important, and oxygen delivery should be restored uh, immediately. This is the primary aim of uh, treatment in polytrauma setting, and life-threatening 
injuries should be eliminated in a, a damage control surgery and we have to define priorities and address them. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you may discuss it. Yeah, thank you, Dima. I mean, this is a topic that need probably to be looked a bit more in depth. And you promote well your work, but I mean, the topic is uh, on trauma today uh, on this, and we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Neuhaus with us. Wh one of the, uh, the the question that we have here with this ATLS is obviously a very important course that I think everybody in Switzerland has. I don't know how it's many other country, but. The worst situation is to be on the site of an injury, and we know today everything can happen everywhere. Our uh, old doctor, at least surgeon, trained to be on the street and be able to, to do that, because I think that's important that all visa, whatever surgeon they are, can intervene on in that. And I know that in Switzerland, the ATLS is done by most other people. My second question here, uh, and maybe speak about Switzerland, on this country and about the regionalization. I think this has evolved the trauma over many years, and I think there's strong data now that every small hospital doing trauma is not the best way to, to achieve that. So we try to have centralization or regionalization for this with quick evacuation of the, the people. And I think it's also an important topic, particularly those days with what can happen in the world. So maybe a comment about the ATLS training for all surgeon or, or, or non-doctors non into this to save life and how we should handle trauma, I mean, made polytrauma in a country like Switzerland or other countries in terms of uh, regionalization. Absolutely. HLS uh, is introduced in the 70s in the United States uh, by an orthopedic surgeon. He had a crash with his uh, private plane and uh, his wife died and three children survived. But uh, because he was a very famous doctor, he was treated very well with his kids weren't so good treated, so he said that's not possible. And then they constructed the HLS. Uh, the HLS is primarily uh, under the hospice of the American College of Surgeons, and is distributed in about 90 countries uh, in Switzerland since 2000, and we do about 20 courses uh, a year in Switzerland. And nowadays, all surgeons uh, need to do an HLS course it's mandatory for uh, the Facharzt FMH, but we also have a lot of anesthesiology guys, and nowadays we have more and more guys from the emergency departments, because uh, the emergency departments are getting, uh, let's say, more and more autonom, and they also need to have these courses, ATLS, ACLS, uh, and similar courses. So uh, while Ten years ago, mainly surgeons and the anesthesiology guys did the course. Nowadays, it's more broad, also internal medicines and other specialists. Um, HLS is uh, every four years, uh, they try to come up with a new edition. Nowadays, uh, we have the 10th edition and it's, uh, it's quite evolving. Uh, for example, CT scanner, it wasn't used 20 years ago. Nowadays, it's quite usual to use CT scanners. So that, that's one point about HLS. Uh, about the trauma in, in Switzerland, I think uh, we have a good system in Zurich. Uh, I like it. We have officially 12 trauma centers in Switzerland. If you look at the numbers, uh, the, the biggest three centers are Bern, uh, it's uh, Luzern and Zurich. We have uh, the highest numbers of polytraumatized patients. And I personally think we have not enough polytraumatized patients. We are too many doctors taking care of these uh, special patients. If you look at uh, different uh, centers, for example, Chur, St. Gala, they have uh, less than 100 uh, polytraumatized patients. And uh, I, I, I think this should be a little bit more centralized, to be honest so that uh, really specialists take care of the polytraumatized patient. The first few hours, it's quite easy to treat polytraumatized patient. I think the, the, the goal, as Dima said, is uh, try to get oxygen to the vital structures. That's quite easy. That's the tube, that's uh, chest tubes, that's maybe a pelvic binder, some fix, external fixator. But then the, the stop the bleeding, it's quite difficult. Uh, I remember just recently one case with a severely bleeding abdominal injury. 
we couldn't fix it, but Kuno was there and uh, he could easily fix it because it was a arterial bleeding at the Mesenterico Superior. And I think that's uh, our main strength in Zurich that we usually do the, the basic work. And as soon as it is uh, tricky, the abdominal surgeons are joining us and together we are, I think, quite good. Our survival curve is, uh, is getting better and better. If we compare the survival rate uh, about 15 years ago, it was 15% or more. And nowadays we are getting lower and lower. And I think that's part of, of the system. Uh, that's the CT scanner, which helps. That's the, the, the teamwork stuff. That's uh, also anesthesiology and intensive care unit, which are getting better. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have one uh, question concerning penetrating abdominal injury in a stable patient, because we had this discussion also in the emergency department, and I would like you to comment on that. Now, um, penetrating trauma is uh, very interesting. Uh, I had the chance to spend uh, one year at the Grotesgur Hospital in uh, Cape Town, and. Uh, the main goal at the Grotesgur Hospital is to treat penetrating abdominal trauma non-operative if possible because otherwise they are overwhelmed with patients and they couldn't handle everything. So they really try to focus on a, a few things. They clearly say that uh, with a penetrating abdominal trauma, as soon as a patient is hemodynamic unstable, uh, that means that the systolic blood pressure is below 90 and heart rate is above 100, and you clearly have the penetrating wound or the retained knife in the abdomen, then you need to operate on a patient with a trauma. Second point is the, the peritonitic patient after trauma, uh, which is a little bit more difficult, I think, to, to see how a patient is uh, peritonitic. Or mental or organ evisceration is uh, usually an is a clear indication to proceed uh, with laparotomy, uh, bleeding from the stomach or uh, uh, anal or vaginal after a penetrating <coughs> trauma is also an indication to proceed with uh, uh, an operation. Uh, I think some indications are quite clear to proceed with an operation. Uh, in the gray area, for example, also having a little bit of air in the abdomen wasn't always an indication to proceed with a laparotomy in South Africa. If we had the chance to do a CT scan and there was air in the abdomen, however, the patient was stable and no peritonitic abdomen, we didn't proceed with the diagnostic laparotomy. Because uh, sometimes it's, it would be just a, a non-therapeutic laparotomy. It would be a positive because of the air, there must be a penetration of the peritoneal layers. However, maybe no significant injury inside the abdomen which needs to be treated. If we look at our history of uh, traumatology here, which goes a long time with some uh, tradition, it seems that the single most important factor in saving life was CT scan uh, in the uh, emergency room. Is now the world standard is that most of these patients, unless of course they are very unstable, should go quickly to the CT scan and then from that basis do the priority? There are quite a lot of studies, retrospective studies, showing that a, a whole body CT scan is helpful in, uh, in lowering mortality, uh, have the patient door to operation, have a low time, uh, be faster, and we think being faster is uh, more advantageous for the patient. However, there was also one prospective study published in Lancet showing that the CT scan didn't uh, reduce mortality. Uh, so more studies needs to be done, uh, need to be done. However, we, we think with the CT scan, we have much more information. Uh, also, if a patient needs an operation, we clearly see the kidneys, how do they look like? Do we really need to explore this area or not? How is the liver injury? How is the kidney injury? Um, I think it's helpful. Well, I, th I think this Lancet paper, which was highly, the problem is that the CT scan was not in the emergency room. There was a huge delay. So here we are comparing apple and orange strategy and no strategy. I think there's a difference. We were a lot of time, and it's pretty obvious if that's the case, you waste time. But 
if you make this diagnosis with this is quick CT today, I think this is our policy here to do this CT scan in, in every patient. So I think this data from the Lancet is not very convincing. Do we even go to the CT scan with unstable patient? Like what, what do you define, or the, when do you say you go to the OR and when do you prefer to still have the CT scan with an unstable patient? There are a few indications uh, not to proceed immediately with a CT scan. One is if the patient really has an airway issue, it's uh, a noisy uh, breathing. Uh, if the saturation is very low, meaning below 85, 90 we usually tolerate, but 85 it's too low. Then we need, first of all, to ablate the chest by a chest X-ray or an E-fast then probably put some chest tube in to get uh, the lungs fully inflated. Uh, the circulation is more and more, let's say, we just need a line where we can uh, give contrast dye. And uh, the, the circulation is, needs to be quite low that we do not proceed with a CT scanner. If the BP is above 80, it's okay to proceed with a CT scanner. Uh, because we, we lose time sometimes uh, doing chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, E-fast, and then sometimes it's not 100% not clear what's going on. Uh, then we do a CT scan, so you, you lose uh, half an hour, an hour, which is uh, dangerous for these patients. Because, uh, as Professor Klovina said, we have a, a special situation in Zurich. The CT scan is really just two meters away. So we really try to get the patient immediately from the stretcher, from uh, the paramedics to the CT scanner, do the CT with a standardized protocol and get it to the theater. I think that's, that's quite good. And, and also, to be honest, it's, uh, we are very fast with uh, all the specialists, for example. Uh, if I remember the last case, it was uh, five to 10 minutes and all the specialists are around meaning neurosurgeons, uh, abdominal surgeons, trauma surgeons. It's I have a comment regarding your statement about the free intra-abdominal air, and, and maybe just for the younger colleagues for clarification, I think the, the Zurich algorithm still um, incorporates a mandatory laparotomy or at least laparoscopy on any patient where we detect uh, radiographic free air. Um, and I think that that just should be stated. My question is, um, what is the ATLS position on uh, minimally invasive access to uh, the abdominal cavity in patients that are being treated at a um, at a, a large trauma center where there's expertise available? Because ATLS has always been a very defensive, very traditional society that has not promoted minimally invasive uh, techniques. Now, ATLS, it's... Uh it's, it's quite, let's say, uh, political. HLS tries to present one safe way, which is valid in Ethiopia and Switzerland, which is completely different. And what they say, they don't uh, recommend laparotomy. They recommend a surgical examination and decision making. Uh, they used to be maybe a little bit more uh, on the laparotomy side, but nowadays they are changing more and more to a more, let's say, the surgeon must decide, but it needs a surgical evaluation, which is, I think, right. It's, it, the laparoscopy is, uh, sometimes we do it here, as you said, especially in these cases with a little bit of a look inside and... And you do that every day, and then you can treat it. Uh, however, in Ethiopia, they don't do laparoscopy, so it doesn't make sense. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.